Praise the Lord. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. I have changed back to my original location, the library. And um, it's good to be back in the library. I love the feeling of being surrounded by books and knowledge. Um, but I hope everybody's been blessed. I hope you're staying dry. <laughs> It stormed yesterday and rained a little bit today in Alabama, where I am. Uh, uh, we are in Exodus chapter 17 and 18 this week. For people that are just joining us for the first time, we're reading the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelations a couple of chapters at a time every Wednesday night at 5 p.m. until the tent revival season is over. Then I'll be back at my regular time, 7.30 p.m. And yes, the tent is up. I'll give info on that during the announcements portion. But for now, I'm going to do a recap. And then uh, you can get your Bibles and read along with me. We are, uh, last week, we were in chapters 15 and 16 of Exodus, where the people of Israel were rejoicing because they had just been rescued from uh, the Red Sea or, or the Reed Sea. Uh, God had made the water stand. They crossed over. So Moses sang a song to the Lord, and Miriam and all the women got their tambourines and sang a song to the Lord. And uh, then they moved from, um, from Egypt, from the city of Ramses to Sukkot, then from Sukkot to Elim, and then from Elim to Shur, and then from Shur to the, the desert of sin or something like that, wilderness of sin. <laughs> and um, that's where we would uh, start this week with my dog William is in the library with me. And he is doing flips <laughs> and turns on the floor. So that's what that noise is if I seem a little distracted. He is a happy dog, and I'm glad about that. So get your Bibles and get comfortable. Get your notebooks and something to drink. And look at Exodus chapter 17 with me in whatever translation you like. And I'll read from King James since that was requested. And I'll discuss it with you. I hope William does not walk to my right with all these cords. Okay, so Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. It says, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. And this has happened before. The last time it happened, I'm tempted to turn my camera to him. <laughs> last time it happened, um, they were, they had waters, but it was bitter. But this time, this says they had no water to drink. Verse 2, therefore, the people quarreled with Moses. They fought with Moses and said, give us water so we may, oh, you know what? I just realized. And I apologize. I need to switch. I'm reading from my phone. I need to switch to King James. <laughs> so let me make that switch. Okay. There we go. Now I'll start over with the right translation here. First, chapter 17, verse 1 of Exodus says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin, after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses. They fought with him. They argued with him, quarreled to him and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? He said, why are you coming to me with this mess? Why are you tempting the Lord? Verse 3, and the people thirsted there for water. They were really thirsty. They're in the desert, in the wilderness, and they're walking. It says, and the people murmured against Moses 
you know, behind, even behind his back, they talked about him and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? He said, Did you bring us from, it, from Egypt to kill us with thirst and our cattle and children? Verse 4, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. So Moses said to God, these people are ready to kill me over this. What should I do, God? Verse 5, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, and therefore, I mean, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. So the Lord told Moses, Go in front of the people, and take your rod with you, your staff, the same one that you hit the river with, and take it in your hand and go in front of the people. So he did. Verse 6 says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And, and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of the Lord. So this is saying, God told him, and look, I will stand in front of you on the mountain in Horeb, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. I'll stand on the rock in Horeb. And that, and you shall hit this rock, bam, <laughs> hit the rock with your, your rod. And there shall come out of this rock that you hit water that the people can drink. And it says Moses um, did did that in front of the elders of Israel. Verse 7 says, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or, or not? So Massa means to test or testing. And uh, Meribah is tempting the Lord, a question, questioning the Lord. So that's why those are called Masa and Meribah, because the children of Israel tested God, saying, are you really with us? Verse 8 says, Then Amalek, <laughs> then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So, let me remind you who Amalek is. We ran into him in Genesis chapter 36, so it's been a while. Amalek is the grandson of Esau. So it's Esau, Am, uh, Eliphaz, and Amalek. So Eliphaz's son. Um, and remember, Esau is the brother of Jacob, the brother of these people's um, fathers or these people's ancestors. So really, with Amalek coming to them to fight, this is saying the descendants of Jacob, it's who Moses and the Israelites are, fought with their brother's descend, Esau descendant. So it's a family affair here. Uh, the And you know, we see Amalek right here himself, but in the future we'll hear of Amalekites, his descendants. So, but eventually they'll be wiped all the way out to the point that today we don't know any Amalekites. We know Israelites, but but that's it. <laughs> no um, Amalekites, no ancient Egyptians. They got wiped out. No Philistines. All the people that have come you know, against the Israelites in the Bible, and God said, I will wipe them out. He did that, and he meant it. So, verse 9 says, And Moses said unto Joshua, who was going to be the second in command to Moses, he said, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God, in my hand. So he said, choose you some men to fight. We're going to go to war. And by tomorrow, we'll do this. I'm going to just, I'm going to stand above you all with the rod of God in my hand. 
so God can help us move. Verse 10 says, So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. I'm tempted to say Amalekites. <laughs> he fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So those are, uh, of course, elders. And Aaron is Moses' brother. So it says, they went up to the top of the hill, like Moses said he would do with his staff. Verse 11, and it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, he held up his hand, that they would win the whole time that Moses held up his hand. When he got tired and his hands dropped, it would not, you know, go in their favor. Let me find where that is. Yeah. So when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. Can you imagine holding up your hands for hours or like all day? I can't really hold up my hands for more than a few minutes. So his hands got heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat there on. So Moses sat on the stone. And it says, And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands. Aaron and Hur held his hands up for him, one on each side, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So this fight happened. Uh, I, it doesn't actually say when it began in the day, but this fight continued on until sunset. So the whole time, uh, her and Aaron were holding up Moses' hand so that the Israelites could win. Verse 13 says, And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So Joshua, the Israelites prevailed. They won against Amalek. They won by the sword. Verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. So that's what I said earlier. God had promised to re remove all ties and blood of Amalek from under the heavens, on the earth. So that's why we don't know an Amalekite to this day. Um, but God told Moses to write it down and remind uh, Joshua because God knew Joshua would be second in command. Moses might not have known it at the time. Because that happens way down in at the end of Deuteronomy. And beginning of the book of Joshua. So that's like four or five books away. But God knew already. So he said, rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Verse 15. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it. Jehovah's Nisi or Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord is our banner. Verse 16, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So he said he did that because of what God's promise was that he would wipe the Amalekites out. So he set it up as a memorial. Now we're in chapter 18. 18 verse 1 says, When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. So let me just explain this right here. Because I said some time ago that the Bible can confuse you sometimes because people have nicknames and places have different names, same place, but different names for a certain place. So this name Jethro here, this man Jethro is also called Reuel, R-E-U-E-L, which means friend of God. Now, I've heard 
one uh, person, I don't know if it was a biblical scholar or not, because it's been years ago, say that Jethro isn't a name, but a title. And Ruel is actually his name. But I don't know if that's true. Jethro could have been his born name, but he could have been renamed Ruel because that was also done in biblical times and in modern times. Like, my name is Dawn India, my first name. But some people call me either or, and some people call me by nicknames. So uh, they did that then. So you would see one or the other, but that's the same person, just heads up. That is Moses' father-in-law, the father of Zipporah. And it says that he and Zipporah and Moses' two sons, when he sent after uh, Jethro, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. Because Zipporah was in Egypt with um, Moses for a while. Then Jethro sent her back to Egypt, to, back to Midian, where they're from. So this is saying they're coming come back from Midian to the current place where um, Moses is. It says, and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien in a strange land. So Gershom means stranger. So, you know, back in biblical times, they named their children based off of the circumstances they are going through. Verse 4 says, And the name of the other was Eleazar. For the God of my father said he was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Eleazar means my God is my helper. So that's why Moses named those boys those things. So this is saying, Reuel, who is Jethro, Zipporah, and Moses' two sons uh, would come to the place there where Moses and the Israelites are. Okay, so we'll go to verse 5. And Jethro, who is Reuel, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness, where he encamped at the mountain of God. And the mountain of God is Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb. Verse 6 says, And he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law, Jethro, or Reuel, am come unto thee, and thy wife and her two sons with her. So he's saying, hey, behold, look, I've, I've come with your family before you. Verse 7, And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance. He bowed down, that's what that word means, to him, and, and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. So, you know, just like a reunion there, he bowed down in front of his father-in-law, gave him a kiss on the cheek or whatever, and they they caught up with each other. They did a little catch-up, went into a tent and talked. Verse 8 says, And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord delivered him, delivered them. You know, Moses is just letting him know from Egypt to then what all had happened, what all God did for them. Verse 9 says, And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro praised God for that. Verse 10 says, And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. So he blessed God for that. Verse 11, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, lowercase g, gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. So I don't know if Jethro, it said Jethro was a priest of Midian or the priest of Midian where the Midianites stayed, they believed that the Midian, they believed Midian was 
like Northwest uh, Arabian Desert area, the scholars today, um, and said he was a priest there. So I don't know if Jethro was a priest to um, God on the Most High God, the real God that we serve or if he was a priest to idols. But either way, if he was a priest for idols, I believe he was converted from hearing what they went through, the Israelites went through, because he began to bless God. He even sacrificed to God. He said he was greater than all lowercase g gods. And he said, for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them, he's saying, the Egyptians were a proud people, but God dealt with them from higher up. He's above even the Egyptians. Because at that time, Egypt was seen as a place, like a saving place. They had the money. They had the food. Mr. William. <laughs> but uh, this is saying God, even that proud people was humbled. By God. Verse 12 says, And Jethro, Moses' father in law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came, remember that's Moses' brother, and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father in law before God. So the elders came. They had great respect for Jethro, who is real well. Uh, verse 13 says, And it came to pass on the morrow, the next day, that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from morning until the evening. Now, in the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, you have a scroll called Judges, or a book called Judges. And even before that, before those judges mentioned there, Deborah, Gideon, Oh, uh, Samson, before all those judges you had, Moses, just him by himself here, a judge and a people and, uh, from morning to evening, so from daybreak to sundown, this one man was judging this great people. And it said in Exodus 12 that um, the number of the people that left Egypt, the Israelites that left Egypt, were 600,000 men, excluding, not including women and children. So one man judging all those hundreds of thousands of people, uh, that's too much. <laughs> I don't see how he got out of there at nightfall. This is said morning to evening. I don't see how he did it by then. Verse 14 says, And when Moses' father-in-law saw, saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? So Jethro was like, why, why are you doing this? <laughs> why are you working yourself to death and wearing on these people's patience? Because if they're like us in modern times, we don't like to stand on a line for long at all. And these, some of these people stand up all day in a line to get to Moses and to get his judgment on an issue that they have and to see what the Lord would want them to do about a certain thing. Because see, at this time, the people didn't have a direct relationship with God like we do. We have an opportunity to actually talk directly to God. We don't need uh, somebody like Moses to come in, talk to God for us. But then they didn't have a relationship with God. Uh, didn't know him, <laughs> so they wanted to talk directly to God's friend, God's priest, Moses, and get his opinion on whatever issues they had. But Jethro was like, why are you doing this all, and all day long? Verse 15, and Moses said unto his father-in-law, because the people come unto me to inquire of God. So he's saying the people come to me to ask what they should do about things of God. They ask God what they should do about things. Verse 16, when they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his law. So he's saying, Moses is saying to Jethro, 
whenever there's an issue that come up, they'll come to me and I'll listen to it, what they're saying, both sides, and I'll make a judgment and let them know what they should do in, in keeping the statutes and laws of God. Verse 17 says, And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Moses' father-in-law said, This is not good. Judging is good in this way. The judging that he's talking about in this way, not, not what some of us can do. <laughs> you know, uh, judging, prejudging, prejudice, prejudging somebody, not even knowing what's going on with them. That's not good, but... Um, what Moses is doing, his type of judging is good, but not the way he's doing it. Verse 18, Jethro is still talking to Moses. He says, thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. So he's saying, you're going to wear your little self out. And these people, it's the, the matter is too heavy for you. It's too much of a burden for one man to carry to judge a whole nation this big of people. You can't do this by yourself. Verse 19, hearken now unto my voice. Listen to me. I will give thee counsel and I'll tell you what to do. And God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people of God word that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. So he's saying, listen to me, and, I, and I'll give you a good counsel, tell you what to do, so that at, uh, for these people, you can bring uh, causes to God. You can bring the matters up to God. Verse 20, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws. So he's saying, teach them the laws of God and ordinance of God, and sh shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work they, they must do. So he's saying to show them how they should walk before God and the work that they should do. Put it in, in them what to do. Verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to, the, to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. So he's saying choose some men of renown. Choose some able-bodied able men that fear God, men that are truthful, and men that won't covet a, a, a thing of somebody else's, that won't look on somebody else's. Well, y'all, people are items with jealousy. Well, y'all, come here. Well, y'all. Hush. He must hear those. Yeah. <laughs> you gonna say hey to them? And he said, make those men be rulers of over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Break them up in smaller groups. William, stop. Come here. <laughs> so that you won't wear your little self out. Let me show you William if you... I don't know if I can do it. Say, hey, William, since you want to interrupt. Yeah. You want to be disruptive. <laughs> okay. I think he's going to sit down now. Um, so he said, make these men rulers over smaller groups to help you so you won't be overwhelmed. You know, after you have already told taught people the laws and statutes of God, if you put that in the people first, then you put these other um, levels of, in other words, establish a judicial system. So you won't be at it alone. So the heavier matters will go to you, and the lighter matters can go to the men before you. Verse 22, and let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and thou shall bear the burden with thee. So that's what I just said earlier, bring the heavier thing 
to you, Moses, and let them handle the smaller things. And you all can bear, bear this burden together, not just by yourself. Verse 23. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. So he's saying, if you do this, and if God tells you that this is a good thing to do, it, and commands you to do this, then you'll be able to make it, you'll be able to endure, and all the people uh, will have a peace on you. Because right now, folks standing in line, from dawn to dust, trying to see this one man. Uh, so it's just too much for them and you. Verse 23, if thou shalt do this thing. Okay, verse 24, I'm sorry. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. It says, so Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. That speaks a lot about Moses to me. And makes me want to be as humble as he is because we're talking about a man who God stands before. Um, I know that at the cleft in the in Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb, in the cleft of that rock, God told Moses that he can't see his face and live. But God also told uh, another person, I forgot, it, es it escapes me right now, that God... Um, talk to his people in parables and so forth. But he talked to Moses face to face. I'm going to uh, put that scripture in the comment section because I forgot where it is. But the, Moses is a true friend of God who listens directly to the voice of God. But he is humble enough to listen to this man from Midian who probably was idolatrous, probably wasn't serving God at first. He listened to him. And of course, me, the, uh, Jethro told him to run these ideas by God and see if he says the same on it. Then he implements what this man said. So that lets me know no matter how, what, what position you might be in in God or what titles you might have, you need to not be so high-minded that you can't listen to somebody that tries to help you, give you advice on a thing. I, I think someplace in the Bible it said that Moses was the most humble man on earth. <laughs> I can see that. I can really see that here. Verse 25 says, And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people. Rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons. The hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. So they implemented what Jethro said. Verse 27 says, And Moses let his father-in-law depart. He let him go, let him leave. And he went his way into his own land. So Jethro went back to Midian. So I guess he was just bringing his daughter and grandchildren to Moses, the um, husband and father to them. So that ends the two chapters for this week. Next week we'll look at chapters 19 and 20. And um, in Exodus Let's get into our announcements. We have some huge announcements. We do have the big, the big blue top tent back up. Our tent, and it is at 728 3rd Avenue West, Birmingham, Alabama. And if the weather permits, because we had to cancel last night, it really, really stormed. Tonight, we will have Bishop... Darren Sanders preaching. Then tomorrow will be Pastor Polly. And Friday would be Apostle Gail Ford. So it's it's a dynamic lineup. Um, and the plan tonight, if it's not gonna um, just storm with, with thunder or flood the area, 
the plan is, if even if it's a little light rain, to continue tonight and not cancel it because it's right in front of a building that we can go into and have service in that building in, instead of under the tent. So if that changes, I will let you all know for sure. We'll post that. But as of now, if the service is not canceled, we'll just have it in the in in the connecting building if we have to, because the facilitator for the tent this time is Pastor um, Demetrius Young, and he has a t-shirt shop right there on Third Avenue West that we're in front of, and he also owns the connecting space right next to that. So that empty connecting space is where we'll have service if the weather is not too bad, but bad enough to not be outside. So um, that's the plan. Uh, also, it's still a tent up for Apostle um, Vita Hinton still has her tent up in Wylam, but she posted already that the service for them would be canceled tonight. She has services on Wednesday through um, Sunday. 7 p.m. and I think Sunday she has a 10 a.m. Uh, ours is Monday through Friday only 7 p.m. Uh, other than that I don't know of any other tents up <laughs> so I think that's all the tents just stay tuned for a weather update or whatever um, kind of update we'll have whether it be in that building or not. If we do have service, I am going to be cooking some fried fish, some french fries, and sodas. So come prepared for that <laughs> if we do have service. Um, other than that, I want to start doing birthday shout outs every month. So everybody for the month of October that had a birthday, happy birthday to you. I did notice today exactly that um, Isaiah Radcliffe's birthday was today. And I just want to give him a birthday shout out live because he I'm so appreciative of what he does for our ministry and for multiple ministries. I know he's at Greater Emmanuel Temple um, as their organist, but he also has touched so many lives and ministries by playing uh, for them at their different engagements and whatever. So we want to give him love. Um, another man in that same spirit is Greg Brown, uh, also an organist who's touched a lot of people. Um, his birthday was two days ago. So they both have that same anointing, <laughs> and that's something that they were born that close to each other. I don't know if they know each other or not, but I, I know Greg Brown used to be the... Uh, organist at um, New Macedonia Baptist Church. Now it's Greater New Macedonia Ministries. Um, but he has uh, moved from New Macedonia. But that's where I knew him from. But happy birthday to everybody born in October. I don't want to miss anybody. You all are equally important and equally loved by God. Um, now we'll move on. Let's no. Nope. The other announcements, I apologize, Mom. <laughs> of course, meet me every Wednesday night at 5 during tent revival season. But my mom, Overseer Mylon Hudson, every Friday night does Bible study, 7.30 p.m. Central. But this Friday, since we have the tent up, and next Friday, she may not be having a Bible study because she hasn't changed her time like I did. I'm trying to beat her. <laughs> so I changed my time so I won't miss any Bible studies. But um, she's going from Revelation to Genesis. And she is all the way up in, I want to say, 2 Timothy already. Because the New Testament scrolls, the New Testament books are shorter than the Old Testament. So it's like I've been in Genesis forever and I'm going to be in Exodus a while. But she's moving Book, 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 book. So that's why I say I'm trying to beat her in a race. But um, join her Friday nights. And I mean, it's always very, very much a blessing. Anytime the word is being read, even if nobody 
expounds on it like we try to do. Just the bare bones word is a blessing to me and to you, whether you know it or not. Your spirit takes that in. So um, join her then. Sunday nights is our regular service time, 7.30 p.m. in the sanctuary. You would have Bishop D.E. Hudson, our pastor, bringing the word of God. And you have um, Minister Dudley on the Dudley on the piano, um, Sister Lisa Rory usually doing the praise and worship, reading scripture, prayer, and her sons, um, the Rory brothers is what I call them, are on percussion. And we're just so thankful for them uh, every Sunday night, 7.30 p.m., tune in. We have different platforms. We don't just have Facebook anymore. Um, we have also YouTube, which is getting um, more recognized because there's a lot of people that are not on Facebook that want to see service. So we'll just share the YouTube with them. I have put all that information in my post here. So you can scroll up and get the names of the Instagram, Twitter, YouTube sites. Get our email down to communicate with us. Our um, Facebook page has our phone number if you want to call and get prayer. Um, you can do that. Or if you are local and have our actual numbers and addresses or whatever, or DM, whatever you want to do, contact us. Leave us a comment or however way you want to reach us saying that you want prayer or you want, you know, help with something. That's what ministry is about. Um, helping, tending to the sheep is what the analogy that's used in the uh, in the Bible. You have the shepherd who is Jesus, and you have a sheep who is all of us, and you have people that are supposed to tend to the sheep for him, and those are the people that are in ministry. So we hope to do that. Uh, if, whether or not you belong to our congregation or not, that doesn't matter, because uh, we're all under one God, one Lord, one baptism. So um, I think that actually does conclude the announcements. We'll move into the prayer portion. And then uh, hopefully I'll see you sometime this week under the tent. Father God, I thank you for every single person that's watching this. I hope that it can touch souls continually, not just on this live video, but for everyone that clicks on in the future through Facebook or YouTube or whatever platform, uh, that they'll be blessed time and time again by your word. Um, I thank you for using us to tend to your people. I know that you have a heart for people, somewhere so that you sent your son to die for us, for our sins, so that we can inherit the kingdom and live with you forever even on the new earth, when you descend down and bring down a new Jerusalem, the goal is to be with you with no more limits, no flesh getting in the way, no sin. Back to the relationship we had in the garden, but even better, because you'll actually live with us. So uh, thank you for using us to help you get towards your goal. I ask you to meet every need of the people spoken and unspoken uh, to us. Uh, we pray protection over everybody during this season where we have had a lot of bad news, bring joy uh, to the and comfort to people that are bereaved. Bring uh, blessings, bring beauty in place of these ashes that we've been having in recent times. And we ask you for these and all other blessings you have in store for us to be released. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, you all stay safe. I hear thunder and some rain, so stay tuned for uh update about the tent revival. All right, love you all. <laughs>